The following program is underwritten in part by World's Best Cat Litter. You love your cat, but you don't love the litter box mess. Switch to World's Best Cat Litter and get a cleaner litter box with less hassle and less litter. Find it at Target, Walmart, and in your local grocery and pet stores. Celebrating the connection with our pets, this is Animal Radio, featuring your dream team, veterinarian Dr. Debbie White and groomer Joey Villani. And here are your hosts, Hal Abrams and Judy Francis. (laughs) That's my scary laugh. It wasn't very scary. Yeah, it was more creepy. (laughs) (laughs) That's because Ladybug is in costume today. She's uh, practicing for Monday where she will go trick-or-treating. And I think you do that because you actually get more candy. And by the way, you're a grown adult lady. You shouldn't be out trick-or-treating or anything like that. I'm not. My dog is trick-or-treating. Okay. And I just have to go with her. Tell the audience what she's uh, dressed up as today. Well, you know what? I decided not to put a costume on her. We didn't do a costume this year. She's got lots of costumes. She's been many different things in the past. So this year, I decided to color her. Yeah. It's different. It is different because she's uh, white with black spots, and her name is Ladybug. So I colored her white red so now she's red with black spots like a true ladybug now what uh, what is what did you use for color there is it safe non-toxic yeah you know i actually use kool-aid kool-aid yeah the packets of kool-aid red kool-aid because i thought that would be a lot safer because sure. it won't you hurt find she's licking herself all the time then <laughs> yeah, you know maybe she does she <laughs> loves maybe she likes the taste cherry what about you gals uh lori do you dress up the dogs at all um, in small costumes, usually a hat or a bow or something, and then uh, we don't go trick or treating, but they are there to help answer the door and give the trick or treaters their candy. Mm. What about you, Doctor Debbie? Uh, what are you dressing up the animals as this Monday? Oh, this year it's going to be the angel and the devil. <laughs> Uh, I'm guessing yeah. that Boss is the devil. Yes, Boss will be the <laughs> devil, and I have this cute pair of angel wings my mother made um, for one of my former dogs and so I've just got to kind of fit them a little bit to Nikki's bigger body size but uh, yeah she's going to be the angel and it's complete with halo and everything as long as she doesn't try to eat it. (laughs) Uh, We got to post pictures up the website so listeners can see that and of course we'd love to hear what you're dressing your animals up. Sometimes they don't like to dress up and sometimes Halloween just freaks out the animals altogether. There are some animals that really even shouldn't be out on Halloween just because they see people in costumes and they they don't know what to make of it. And then, of course, the day after Halloween, Tuesday, get ready, Dr. Debbie. Oh, my goodness, yes. I can't tell you how many calls we get. And it's it's really the whole week or two before and after the holiday because people have, you know, candy out. Um, I can remember espresso covered or chocolate covered espresso beans was a real problem for one pet one year. Um, but yeah, mass quantities of chocolate will lead to maybe that the least digestive upset. Maybe we'll get some vomiting and diarrhea, but otherwise pancreatitis. My own dog once had the worst chocolate toxicity that had heart arrhythmias and, um, he was a really sick puppy when he It had. takes a lot of chocolate and isn't dark, dark chocolate more offensive than, uh, uh, the lighter chocolate? And milk chocolate. Milk chocolate. It is, yeah. So it takes, you know, for, for milk chocolate or white chocolate, it takes a lot of chocolate for, to be toxic. Um, but yeah, with the darker chocolates, or baking chocolate is where you're going to get the most dangerous thing. And that's actually what my dog got into was uh, European dark chocolate. Mm. <laughs> Large quantities of it. Oh, so. my. And you must have felt like an idiot being a veterinarian. And- <laughs> Thanks, Hal. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, can, you, can you put that any nice, nicer? Nice, <laughs> you know there I mean. is nothing, nothing that happens to regular people. Pet owners' animals doesn't happen to veterinarians' dogs. I've had toxicities. I've had cactus attacks on my dogs. It uh, all happens, and we are no different. So. But it turned out well in the long run. It did. Okay. Yes. Robert Semro just around the corner. He has seven Halloween treats to keep your pet safe. Seven Halloween treats to keep your pet safe. Now he does the list of mania every week. Usually it's in uh, the number of five. So we get seven this week. That's seven. Seven. Very excited about that. Also on the show today, just a few minutes. You may have seen this video online. I know it's over at our Facebook page at Animal Radio. It's a video of a chicken watching TV. And I think as soon as we saw the video, I said, we got to book this chicken. So we've booked the chicken and the guardian. I understand they're both very vocal. And they'll be on the show with us in just a few minutes to explain her TV watching habits and what what it's like to have a chicken in your life. They have a lot of personality. Yes, they do. Yeah, more than you probably expect. Also, the crazy doctor, Dr. Ernie Ward, and I say he's crazy because the last time we had him on the show, 
He uh, locked himself in a car. Hot car. A hot car yes. during sweltering yes. temperatures to uh, to find out what it's like if you leave your dog or cat or any animals in the car just for a few minutes in hot temperatures. Mm-hmm. And so he'll be back. Is he doing something crazy this time? Not not as crazy as he did last not time. Not as crazy. No, but he's he's got some some nice little trivia that he's going to tell us about animals, about cats and dogs. Oh, very excited about that. Lori, you're working very hard over there. I think that perhaps you have too many news stories. Give us one of them. Uh, one of them. Oh, you know, um, near and dear to my heart, senior citizens and animals, of course, and putting them together to make the world a better place. Oh, I've always believed mm-hmm. in therapy animals. Great for the senior citizens. Oh, oh. Yeah, great but these everybody. animals might not all be um, alive. Huh. Okay. Well, I'm going to stick around about for dead that. Animals, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Uh, okay, that's okay, on the way. Away, uh, yeah. Let's go to the phones. Take it away, Doc. <laughs> Toll free one eight six six four zero five eight four zero five. Don't forget, you can also ask your questions from the free Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android and BlackBerry. I was told I had to mention BlackBerry because people some people still, still have, have Blackberries. Wow. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> let's uh, go to the phones right now. Uh, we have Sherry. Hi, Sherry. How are you? I'm excellent. How are you? Good. What's going on? Good. Well, it's a nice rainy day in Sun River, Oregon. (laughs) (laughs) Sun River is rainy, huh? Yes, it is. Um, I have two little chihuahuas. One is all white and the other one is black. And um, the black one developed some dry skin, which kind of got um, flaky, almost like dandruff. And then it started to smell very strongly. I bathed her with some baby soap, and it's a little bit better. She doesn't smell as bad, but I'm just wondering, is it more of a yeast thing, or is it just the dry skin? Okay, great question. And unfortunately, with a black-coated dog, you're going to notice that dry skin all the more apparently than on your your other dog. And I'm assuming your your other chihuahua has healthy skin, does not share the same problem? Correct. And they eat the same foods. Is she itchy, scratchy with this? No, doesn't seem to be. She likes it when I scratch her back, but she doesn't seem to be spending the entire day scratching herself, no. And it's more okay. right at the base of her back. Okay, all righty. And then is there, are there any sores or hair loss that she's experiencing? She's not experiencing the hair loss per se, but yes, I would say that some of it dries to where it's so hard that when I do scratch it off, it will leave a little opening in the skin, but there's not Uh, sores before I start to take off some of the the hard flakiness. Okay. It it sounds like in your dog situation that we do have something potentially medical going on, which is different than just a pet that has just flaky, dry skin. And a couple things Mm -hmm. that you've said really make me think that. One is that you've described an odor. And yeah, um, that does definitely make me think of some kind of infection, bacterial and or yeast infection that can be part of that. Um, and then the other thing was the sores or the fact that when you pull off like, some of this hair, there's an open spot below there. Um, so mm-hmm. that, too, would make me think that we have um, an issue that we need to be addressing. So if I were to see your baby, I would definitely take some skin samples um, so that I could look at that quickly under the microscope to get a direction. Because you mentioned yeast, and that can be a real problem for some dogs, and it can take a long time to manage that. Um, so we'd want to know what we're up against, um, whether that's going to need some something just topical, or if we have to add in an oral yeast medicine um, as well. Um, Additionally, there's some great products topically that we would use, and if we do think we have an infection, we might tend to go to things that have uh, antibacterial properties. So there's some... um, uh, shampoos and topicals that have a, a TRIZ component. Um, it's TRIZ EDTA. So it's um, part of the medical therapy for bacterial infections. Other things we might use are shampoos that contain antifungals like um, ketoconazole. And there are a lot of uh, veterinary prescription shampoos and topicals that we can use if that is a direction we feel that your pet has. Um, okay. 
So I think that's going to be really the biggest thing because all of the other types of things, um, you know, as far as types of supplements or um, home remedies, I, I really wouldn't encourage you to go first with that. We might use those okay. to supplement um, the veterinary care. Uh, for instance, mm-hmm. a lot of dogs with dry skin or chronic skin conditions, I will put on um, omega fatty acids or the fish oils, preferably. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That can be a great way to help from the inside to provide good quality quality hair coat and um, avoid dry skin. Uh, Dogs and cats are a little different. They benefit more from the fish oils than, say, from flaxseed oil, which isn't converted as effectively in a dog. Um, So that is an important distinction that we do have with them. Um, But some other things that that I often will use might even be things that contain um, coconut oil. Um, And it actually has not so much a a moisturizing effect, but it has an antibacterial, antifungal property. So... um, some of the different topicals that contain that, or even using coconut oil as a supplement um, topically f- um, for some of these skin conditions can be helpful when we're dealing with the, the infection component of it. So, yeah, I think we've got a little bit of work to do there. Now, the other thing that I always like to mention, and you got a young dog if, you know, she's only three, four years old, um, but things like um, thyroid conditions or other hormone problems can contribute towards dryness or a tendency to have types of infections as does um, pets that have allergies. Pets that have allergies have a weakened skin barrier, and they will more commonly become, um, uh, they will develop a bacterial or a yeast infection just because that skin doesn't have the resiliency um, that a normal dog would have. Is that more prone to the uh, purebreds? Um, not necessarily. Um, some of it is a matter of just an individual basis. I mean, I do see a ton of breeds uh, that particularly have allergies. In my area, we have a lot of uh, Jack Russell Terriers and pet bulls that tend to have allergies, especially if they're a little bit more on the white pigmented side. Um, but really, any dog could have an allergy, mutt or right. a purebred. Well, it looks like I need to make a trip to my vet. I think so, yeah. I, mean, right. I hope that baby gets uh, feeling good and that skin gets well, looking better for you. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sherry, for your call. Send your rain this way, will you? <laughs> Toll free one 405 8405 to reach out to the Dream Team right now. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now at one 405 8405 We can't tell you why canine caviar is the only alkaline-based dog food, but we can tell you alkaline is proven to minimize the risk of renal failure and pancreatitis, reduce scratching, cellular degeneration, and disease, keeping your furry friend youthful and healthy longer. And those are the reasons we can fit into this short commercial. But by visiting caninecaviar.com, you'll see exactly what we do to make a better food for your dog. Try the one and only alkaline dog food risk-free. Canine Caviar. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now at Celebrating the connection with our pets, write down this toll-free number, 1-866-405-8405. On the other end of that phone, Dr. Debbie, dog father Joey Volani. He'll answer your questions about your, well, grooming questions mostly. Mostly. And Dr. Debbie, she'll answer your questions about your animal's medical status. If you just want to call and say hello, we'd love to hear from you. You can also ask your questions from the free Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android. It's a free download. Wow. Halloween just around the corner. Again. This is where I always gain, like... uh, (laughs) It starts, doesn't it? You know, it's become a holiday for the adults, I think. You see, see, less and less kids, and mostly teens, will come to our doors. Yeah. Like older teens. And the costumes are getting more and more racy for young children. Like, oh my gosh, I would never have worn that as a kid. We saw one this morning was the uh, Kim Kardashian being uh, 
held for uh, held jewelry, up, yeah. held up for jewelry, oh, costume. Oh my gosh! Yeah, and, and a white robe with a big blingy ring is the <laughs> Kardashian costume. Uh, every year, and you know, this year there's going to be a lot of Trump costumes too. So, oh boy, do you, Judy? Do you actually dress up too? No, I no, haven't I d- dressed up in years. Yeah, I don't. I know some people they'll do the matching costumes with their animals. Yeah, I've so, always threatened to do that, but I'm not going to paint I'm myself not- red. <laughs> oh, we we have a costume contest at our office Do you? every year. Oh, how yeah, fun. so I I foot the you know the the prize of some sort and um, everyone gets into it. We had like ninety percent of my staff last year that dressed up, so we have a lot of great spirit for it. What's the prize, What's, Dr. Debbie? It, it could be anything from food to uh, movie night, uh, dinner out with Dr. Debbie. <laughs> you name it. <laughs> You, you have a fun place to work. I wouldn't mind being a vet assistant uh, over there. So if you ever need a little yeah, help. Yeah, I could work. I've worked at vet for vets before. I could work for your office. In just a few minutes, Robert Samaro with seven Halloween treats to keep your pets safe. And, you know, sometimes Halloween's not the best holiday for your pets. You know, if you if you have one of those pets that freaks out easily, you probably don't want to be letting them out to see all these people in the costumes and Acting, acting all freaky like because that could scare them yeah and if you have one of those door dashers you might want to make sure they're in another room yeah. and c- closed off so that when the front door opens they don't charge now you have nike the door dasher <sighs> he's a cat that does it i have to lock him in another room and i know he likes to dress up with his little cape but i have to be very careful because he tries to run out the front door he wants to see everybody you have a cat that lets you put a cape on him he struts when i put it on him <laughs> he knows now this is debatable i think he's just trying to run away from <laughs> No, he sits there like he's just king. He loves that cape. He also thinks he's a dog. <laughs> he's a little different as far as cats go. That's true. Are cats or dogs smarter? Who's the, who's the smarter of the species? We'll find out in just a couple of minutes with Dr. Ernie Ward. He's the guy that we had on, I think, a couple of years ago. Uh, three years ago? 2013. Yeah. I guess he locked himself in a car during hot temperatures outside to see what it's like when you lock your dog in the car, when you run into the bank, when you run into the uh, beauty salon, just for a few minutes and you leave the dog in the car, temperatures can be really oppressive up in 110, 20. Wow. They can get really hot very fast. So he, he wanted to prove the point and he locked himself in a car and uh, we talked to him then. He's going to come back on this time. I don't think he's going to be as crazy this time no no he's, he's not locking himself into anything this time that's around the corner Lori. what are you working on over there in the newsroom oh a great story about uh, service animals uh, a special project because oh uh, let's say most service animals are what kind of animal dog yeah dogs right pretty yeah. much not for this project. It's starting a, a whole new thing that we're going to study on how this animal will be helping children with special needs. Mm, okay, mm. maybe it's a service ferret. I got myself a service <laughs> ferret. How it, did you know? It has a little badge. It's so cute. Little vest. Little vest. Little <laughs> service vest. Yeah. <laughs> it says, "Don't touch this ferret." I'm working. Yes. <laughs> Hi, it's Alan Cable. Meredith Vieira's got a dog. His name's Jasper. She loves her dog, but her husband, Richard, not so much. When I hear the word Jasper, every muscle in my body tightens. I expect a hideous shriek, but um, I rest my case. So why does Meredith Vieira's dog, Jasper, shriek? I think he's doing it from a good place, and also maybe there's a little jealousy. I'm not jealous of the dog. Ah! Jasper is very possessive and really thinks he owns Meredith. Richard's pretty much right. I don't think that the dog thinks in those terms. I think the dog sees me as his best friend. Meredith couldn't be more wrong. They're both actually having a good time with this. Richard wrote a book about Jasper. I can't get into my own bed because the dog won't let me do it. Perfect animal. Jasper! Richard's book is called, I Want to Kill the Dog. Now, it's just a joke. He doesn't really mean it. It's all tongue-in-cheek. I would never hurt an animal, but if a meteor landed on his head. So they're clowning around, but Meredith does know that her dog has a problem. The dog has a barking problem, but I have long felt that it's not the dog that has the problem. It's we as trainers and being we didn't do a good enough job training the dog. She's right. Too much affection and at the wrong times. This dog obviously thinks he's in charge. Remember what Richard said about not being able to get 
shit in his own bed. The dog thinks he's the pack leader. He's taking Richard's spot. He's taking the whole house. So the humans in this house have become the underlings and the dog is ruling the roost. Now you might think, who cares? They're all happy. Dogs are not happy being in charge. It stresses them out. This is why there's only one leader in each pack. Only certain dogs are meant to be leaders. Dogs like to follow. And when a dog that's meant to follow is forced to be in charge because the humans don't take that position, it causes stress and anxiety. Dogs need structure. They need rules. To be happy, they need limitations and boundaries. They need you to be a strong, confident, trustworthy, fair leader. That's how you get a calm, happy dog. Good boy. This is Animal Radio. All dogs should eat a pH-balanced alkaline diet. An alkaline diet reduces health risks and can also reduce scratching, shedding, and hot spots. So does this mean you need to check your dog's pH balance? No, because canine caviar has created the first and only alkaline dog food that is pH balanced. It also has the highest metabolized calories. What does this mean? Your dog needs to eat less. Get a healthier dog and save money with canine caviar products. Find them at your local pet supply store or online at caninecaviar.com. This is an Animal Radio News Update brought to you by Fear Free. Fear Free takes the pet out of petrified and puts the treat into treatment. To learn more and find a certified Fear Free veterinary professional near you, visit fearfreepets.com. I'm Lori Brooks. Your next dog or even your parents' or grandparents' next dog might very well be a robot. You see, Hasbro has launched a new lifelike robotic dog this month. It's a companion pet pup to go with their companion pet cat. That's already been on the market. Now, both are designed to bring comfort and companionship to aging adults. And they say the robotic cat with its really soft fur kind of gently vibrates when it purrs. And the puppy will bark and then, you know, cock its head, that little head tilt, when you speak to it. But those are not the only pet robots or robot pets on the market. Hansa Creations sells a collection of interactive cats and dogs of different various breeds, while Paro, the cuddly seal robot, was developed earlier by Japan's National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, and it's used as an interactive therapeutic tool in hospitals and senior living facilities all around the world. But the big question, I mean, don't we all love seniors and animals? So are they effective at offering the same health benefits as our real-life animal friends? Mm -hmm. Well, according to a few small studies, they might be, but more research is needed. Still, it looks good now. One of the first studies being done in a nursing home, it showed that a robot companion can be a big benefit to seniors and can even be as effective as a living animal. Really? Really? (laughs) Really? (laughs) Really? Now, Now... now, I will get to some things that will you'll go, hmm, okay. that makes sense. But remember, a lot of these people, too, have, um, they call it confused, but might have dementia. Ah. So it's, it's a different world for them. Um, another study with the SEAL robot Paro, they studied two groups of seniors for three months where participants in both groups completed tests beforehand that measured uh, their loneliness, depression, what they thought their quality of life was. And researchers found that loneliness scores decreased in the group that spent time with Paro the robot seal, but loneliness scores actually went up. Mm. They increased in the control group, and that was a group that had done various things like field trips. They played bingo and did other social activities while the others were playing with Paro. Uh, When interviewed, some of the people in nursing homes said they actually preferred robot pets because they wouldn't have to worry about them if they had to be admitted to a hospital. However, the authors of the study caution that social policies which might make robotic pets more accessible and affordable, such as to socially isolated seniors living in institutional settings, that those policies should be weighed against policies making living animals more accessible and affordable to everybody. You know, in other words, is it going to offset the the good that rescuing a live animal might do? Sure, sure. But I got to, you know, I got to say... 
if there was for me and I'm not a senior yet or much of a senior yet, I don't think that I would feel any less isolated or lonely from a machine or a robot. But you're saying that the the seniors with dementia that probably don't even know the difference, don't probably. even know that this is a robot, mm-hmm. you're finding it effective. Correct. Well, what about you, Judy? Would you feel less lonely if you had a robot pet as opposed to a live pet? You know, it's one of those things I couldn't really answer until I was placed in that position. I mean, I guess it would be better than nothing. And I guess I don't know what my mental state would be. And, you know, if I were still sharp, again, I wouldn't have to worry if I did have to be hospitalized, what would happen to the animal. That's always a concern is who's going to take care of it. Right. So exactly what you said, Judy, because some of them had to be in their right mind to realize that they would be better off with a robotic pet. Like you said, if they have to be hospitalized. Right. Yeah. What about the effect? I mean, people have friendships with uh, people on the Internet. And not to say that having some connection to someone across a computer isn't significant, even though it's not a living being. So why couldn't a person have a connection to a robo-animal? Well, because yeah. it is a living being on the other side there of the computer. Yeah, but you can't there's... touch them. You can't be exactly. No, but you know there's somebody there that's making decisions to be there with you. These robotic animals, at least there's something tangible you can touch, you can hug, you can sleep with, you can cut. Something to look forward to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, get a stuffed animal. Jeez. Yeah, I- I'm thinking that our show, Booker, yes. might have to call you know Hansa Creations or the uh, National Institute in Japan of their Advanced Industrial Science and Tech. Can you get Guido I- on that? Because I think we should talk to them. Yes, we should. I'm sorry. I just had to put my two cents in there. Hey, I I absolutely understand. Here's a a little bit more. The Missouri University Research Center for Human-Animal Interaction is introducing a new program. I love this. It's called the Feline Friends Project, and that is going to pair children with autism with a cat. And they're going to study the impact that the cat has on the child's anxiety level and social skills. Both are, you know, problem areas for kids with autism or on the spectrum. The center has published several studies that show the benefits that children with autism receive from having pets in the home, like increased social skills, are way up because of the cat. So with this study, researchers hope to find possible benefits that are unique to the behaviors of cats, which we know can be underappreciated by people, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, and here's why. You know, dogs are great companions, but many children with autism are really hearing sensitive, noise sensitive to the sound and loudness of a dog's bark. Mm -hmm. And a dog's playfulness can sometimes be viewed by autistic children as aggression. Mm. So you can see where, you know, a a calm cat, certainly not a cat that bats and claws a lot would be good. But experts believe the less aggressive and quieter behavior of cats is going to appeal to the children a great deal. And uh, the Feline Friends Project, by the way, currently raising money to pay for food and other supplies that these cats are going to need throughout this study. So you can look them up if you'd like to be a behind-the-scenes supporter of this kind of research to benefit cats and autistic kids. Hmm. I mean, how many cats do we have in shelters? So isn't that great? Uh Uh-huh. Would be good. It would be a win-win. I agree, Judy. Uh, pets, particularly dogs, pop up all the time in, you know, the presidential lives. Presidents become more popular all of a sudden when they get a puppy. There have been actually presidents who got an animal, a cat or a dog, when they needed to get favorable points from the public. Uh-huh. Uh, looking back, Richard Nixon, they say, might never have even gotten to the White House if he hadn't used Checkers, the Cocker Spaniel, is a diversion from a campaign finance scandal. (laughs) Lyndon Johnson posed for reasons we will never understand. Uh, He used to pick up his beagle by the ears. Uh, The decor at one Obama White House party was many variations on the theme of Bo. What is it, a Portuguese water hound? Water dog, yes. Water dog, yeah. Now, this tradition goes way back. James Garfield had a Newfoundland, I love this name, Vito. <laughs> Isn't that a great name for a, uh-huh. a White House dog? Calvin Coolidge, did you know, had four cats, seven birds, nine dogs, two lion cubs, a raccoon, a bear, a wallaby, an antelope, and 13 ducks. Jeez. Wow. That's a lot of men. That's a, that's a mini farm, yes, right? Yes, it is. Yeah.
Now, the Clintons had Socks the cat and Buddy the lab when they were in the White House. But have you noticed you don't hear any stories about Donald Trump's animals? Does he even have any? Yeah. (laughs) They're saying no, he doesn't. And if he does, even his campaign people do not know about an animal in his life. There is some question, in fact, about whether he's even had an animal that he was friendly with. Uh, for a while, there was a story about Trump begging for prayers for a lab who was undergoing some major surgery. I'm sorry to say, though, that was a hoax. Oh. So think about this. If he wins the election, we could have the first president in history who will maybe refuse to pardon the Thanksgiving turkey. <gasps> well, I think that'll be the least of our problems. But <laughs> on, on a uh, similar subject, Jerry Brown, his dog, you know, everybody's been very wrapped up in his dog, Jerry Brown. And he's the governor of The governor of California. California. I'm sorry about that. Should have said that. Dog just passed. And it seems to be uh, very emotional for a lot of people. A lot of organizations reporting that people are making comment about it. And his social media is blowing up about it. So... Sorry for that loss here. Yeah, nothing grabs our heart like an animal. We all know what it's like to lose one. Mm -hmm. I'm Lori Brooks. Get more breaking animal news anytime at AnimalRadio.com. This has been an Animal Radio News Update brought to you by Fear Free. The veterinarian isn't typically thought of as your pet's favorite place to go. With Fear Free, that all changes. To learn more and find a certified Fear Free veterinary professional near you, visit FearFreePets.com. Hi friends, this is Dr. Marty Becker, America's veterinarian. As you know, going to the vet can be a traumatic experience for your pet, but it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, vet visits can be something your pet looks forward to. Introducing Fear Free. When your veterinarian is Fear Free certified, you will be assured your pet's vet visit is more free of fear, anxiety, and stress than ever before. Fear Free takes the pet out of petrified, and it puts the treat into treatment. To find a certified Fear Free veterinarian near you, go to fearfreepets.com. Dogs or cats, horse or emu, animals are people too. I've heard of a wonder bra, but I wonder what Jill Nispel was thinking. The 35-year-old Floridian woman was recently arrested for stuffing her bra with a parrot. It was a rare green-winged parrot she stole from her employer, Baby Exotic Birds of Englewood. She then tried to trade the parrot for a vintage car. But when she told the car's owner about her bra-stuffing technique, he called a good friend of his, who just happened to be the owner of the bird shop she stole the bird from. The parrot was valued at $2,000, and the bra-stuffing bird snatcher was charged with grand theft. I'm Britt Savage for Animal Radio. Animals are people, too. Animal Radio. I am the family dog, and it's that time of year again. The one where pet parents start looking for Fido-friendly hotels and destinations where Fido is welcome. Make no bones about it. Pets are part of the family, and we like to sniff out new places too. And we hate to be turned away, especially when we're on our best behavior. So we won't be left out in the cold. Be sure to pick up a copy of Fido-friendly magazine to find the best hotels and destinations where Fido is always welcome. Go online to FidoFriendly.com and subscribe today. You're listening to Animal Radio. If you missed any part of today's show, visit us at AnimalRadio.com or download the Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android. It's Animal Radio celebrating the connection with our pets. Grab and bring them around the radio. It's always much more fun to listen to Animal Radio with your pets. You know who we have on the phone? I think it was July of 2003. 13? I know. I can't believe it was that long ago. We had Dr. Ernie Ward on. He was uh, locking himself in a hot car to find out what it would be like if you locked your animals in the hot car. And you know, we always say it only takes a couple of minutes for the car to really heat up. You say you're going to run into the bank real fast. And in that time, you could have a very sick and ill pet. You know, fortunately, since Ernie did this stunt, there's been lots of legislation, both in New York and California, Mm -hmm. that allows you to break into cars where there's an animal suffering. Yes. So I'd like to think that Ernie started that. Doc, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great, and I I can't believe it's been that long, and and you're absolutely right. That video did help uh, change minds, and, and it definitely touched hearts. And we're on our on the right path, I believe, to trying to get proper legislation and rules to help us all save pets that we love so much. Absolutely. Now, do you have cats or dogs at home? Dogs, cats, fish, hamsters, everything. Do you think your cats are smarter than your dogs? 
oh boy, here we go again, right? Yeah. You really want to get me in some hot water with everybody. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the fact is, intelligence is a very complex subject. And, and, you know, dogs and cats display their intelligence in different and unique ways. When you look at the actual anatomy of the two species, cats end up on the better side. Wow. In fact, they've got over twice the number of neurons or brain cells than uh, dogs. So cats are, are really, you know, creative. All this extra brain mass is really going to do a couple of things. Number one, I think it helps them avoid a lot of work because the last time I checked, my dog and cat definitely lay around and my cat just bags and you know we have to, to take care of her every need and, uh -huh. and any desire but uh, they're they're dexterous and I think people overlook the fact that a cat is so adept with its paws I mean they can grasp objects if you've ever watched your your cat use a food puzzle which I'm a big fan of uh -huh. you know reaching down and they can grasp and they can fish I mean they can climb they can claw so it's amazing dexterity and I you know I've been saying, saying this for you know about 20 years that cats are just one opposable thumb away from planetary dominance <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so cats cats have the edge on dogs when it comes to the brain anatomy. Yeah, well, we know the cat started the internet, but I gotta figure this one out. My dog, when I do something that ticks her off, she doesn't remember very long. You know, she's kind of ADD. A minute later, she's wagging her she's tail. wagging her tail onto something else. But I piss off my cat. My cat will remember it for years, it seems like. Is there... And, you know, there's research to yeah. back that. And, in fact, you know, studies show that cats can retain an, an event or some information for up to 16 hours while our poor pooches can only hold that for about five minutes. And this is why it's so important. When people, you know, I get this call all the time, and I'm sure you do too, where people say, I came home and my dog messed on the carpet, and I rubbed his nose in it, and I gave him a good spanking. Ugh. Well, your dog doesn't remember going to the potty five minutes ago yeah. so it does no good and this is important for us to understand the psychology and and just basic brain activity of our pets because that tells us how to train them so coming home rubbing their nose in it yelling at them does no good at all your cat on the other hand is probably holding a grudge overnight yeah <laughs> so if we're training them we need to reward them if they're doing something proper immediately Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the really important thing of the past 20 years. We know from the research that it is the timing of the reward. So if you're trying to train a dog to sit, it's the gap between the sit and the reward, be it food or praise or a clicker. You know, whatever that, that reward is, it's got to be nearly instantaneous. And I don't know if you saw this recent research that was published uh, just a few months ago from North Carolina State University, but they actually paired up uh, humans and they pitted them against robots to see who could train a dog faster to sit. And sadly, human beings lost. And it was basically because mm. the computerized robot, robot device was able to dispense the treat faster, more consistently. So I think you know, we can take a lesson from that and we can say, look, it's all about the timing. If we want to get better results when we're training our dogs to do whatever, we've got to make sure that we're consistent and delivering those rewards almost instantaneously. Mm -hmm. You know, I noticed Ladybug, the studio stud dog, when her mom, which is uh, Judy, is away and comes back home, she seems to know a long time before Judy even walks in the door that mom's on the way home. And yet the cat wouldn't care. Doesn't care. <laughs> Somebody's home. Right. And, you know, this is something that's been studied a lot in the past decade. And we don't understand this uncanny ability of our dogs to detect our presence when we're pulling down the street a quarter of a mile or more away. And, and scientists don't have it fixed yet, but there may be a relationship to the amount of ferrite, which is a trace mineral in the brain of dogs. And this helps them actually sense the Earth's magnetic field. It's one of the reasons why the funny, you know, pooping on the north and south axis. Is that for real? Was coming out. Yeah. And so sometimes they say, look, maybe these dogs are using this extra sensory perception to cue in on your energy. And maybe that's how they tell. But I, I'm like you. I don't know how it happens, but I know that my dogs are there waiting for me. And I've gotten the GoPro out and proven this to my wife <laughs> yeah. because they're out there about five minutes before we show up at the door waiting. Listen, uh, you got a website. and We're out of time, and I always have so much fun with you. But I want to uh, send listeners to a website where they can learn a little more about Dr. Ernie Ward. 
You bet. Uh, certainly the website is DrErnieWard.com. I've got a YouTube channel. We've got all kind of fun videos of me traveling around the world, talking to different vets and tackling different problems. So check out on YouTube, Dr. Ernie Ward. But certainly the website is DrErnieWard.com. Let's not wait too long till we visit again. <laughs> That's right. Let's Maybe we'll solve once and for all this how and why do dogs poop in certain places. <laughs> uh, we're going to head back to the phones, toll free, one 866 405 8405 Well, don't you know this healthy serving of Animal Radio? It's brought to you by the grain-free Red Barn Naturals canned food for dogs and cats. And did you know it's always made in the USA with natural, functional ingredients to support your pet's optimal health? You can learn more over at redbarninc.com. And we thank you so much, all of our underwriters, for underwriting Animal Radio. People say less is more. At Red Barn, we think less is better. It's what you won't find that sets our natural premium pet food apart. No byproducts, no corn or soy, no fillers. Just the natural ingredients your pets need to live the healthy life they deserve. Look at the label. We want you to. Red Barn Naturals Pet Food. Simply the best. Find it in your local pet specialty store. Red Barn canned food for cats and dogs is grain and gluten free. Celebrating the connection with our pets, this is Animal Radio, featuring your dream team, veterinarian Dr. Debbie White and groomer Joey Villani. And here are your hosts, Hal Abrams and Judy Francis. Well, this hour we're going to talk to the chicken and perhaps the guardian, too, that watches TV. Now, I understand the chicken, you've seen this viral video, I'm sure. If you haven't, head on the over to it. chicken watches TV? The chicken watches TV. Yeah, we're having the guardian on so she can <laughs> translate. For the chicken. Well, I understand the chicken talks a lot. Well, she does, but 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 the guardian understands her, so she has to translate because she speaks chicken. Now, you've had a chance to uh, sit chickens before. I have. Yes, it's yes. because you pet sit all kinds of animals, and I pet sit chickens. And and what's but that? But you like? don't sit on their eggs, no, do you? Do you? No, <laughs> no, no. I let them do that. The, the chickens that I watch are very friendly. I can pick them up, and they'll stand on my lap, and I can pet them and hold them, and they're very friendly, and they they follow me around. And do you think they have personalities? They do. There, you know, I there's six at this one place I watch, and they're all different. Well, I'm very you know? curious to find out what this chicken watches on TV. <laughs> Does it have a preference? Yeah, there might be certain shows that uh, the chicken. Uh, what's the chicken's name? TV? Strawberry. Strawberry. Yes. yes. Okay, so that's on the way this hour. In just a couple of minutes, we're going to go to the phones for your calls. Toll free one eight six six four zero five eight four zero five. Also, at the bottom of the hour, we're going to do a quick check of the news with Miss Lori Brooks. Our Miss Brooks. What are you working on for this mm-hmm. hour? Well, um, you know, when kids go off to college, they tend to get homesick. When they get homesick, they leave college. So all these universities are trying to figure out how do we get kids to stay in college? Well, they figured out a way, and we'll tell you, it involves an animal. Yeah, okay, it's on the way. I got very homesick. Anytime I left home, if it was summer camp, if it was school, I always got dreadfully homesick and would end up back at home within... uh, couple of weeks. <laughs> I was going to say a couple hours, Hal. <laughs> yes. Much to my parents' chagrin. You know, they thought they finally got rid of me for summer <laughs> and uh, off to summer camp. But I did not. But there was one year they showed us horseback riding. And I just really got into the horses. And that took my mind off it. So I'm uh-huh. thinking I know where Lori's going to go with this. And we'll find out in just a few minutes right here. But first, your calls. Hi, Terry. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Very good. Where are you? I am in Ohio. Well, you are on with Dr. Debbie. Well, hello, Dr. Debbie. So what do you have going on with you? Well, I have two Sheltie puppies. Um, they are eight, will be eight months old, the 15th of this month. And the little female, she's very tiny. Uh, she's only about maybe 15 pounds right now. And her brother is like 33, and they're out of the same litter. You'd never believe these are the same puppies out wow. of the same litter. It's a big difference, yeah. Yeah, it is a huge difference. Um her teeth, her front, I assume they're the canine teeth, the ones that point down and then kind of get in sync with the bottom ones, the long mm-hmm. ones, they're coming in on an angle. They're protruding forward. At first, we didn't think she was going to get those teeth. And then they start coming in, and so now they're pointing forward, and it's kind of forcing her bottom teeth out. Is there... Is, is there something we need to be concerned about? Um, I mean, I've been on the Internet, and I've seen where they put braces on dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes sure. they pull the teeth. 
uh, but when they pull the teeth that they have complications. Is it something that we can just let her go with, or is it going to interfere with her eating, or, or what? Well, generally, and what you're describing is where um, the canine teeth are the big kind of like the fang teeth. And um, particularly in Shelties, we do see this congenital deformity, if you call it that, where that big hook tooth, it is pointed forward, and it can actually interfere with the gum and cause some problems when they become more mature. Uh So it does usually warrant some intervention. And I'd say that most people tend to go to either one of two schools um, of belief here. One would be to extract that tooth um, because knowing that it's going to create problems, it's going to get caught on the tooth, we're going to have a um, an area where there's going to be uh, excess tartar that's going to build up. Uh-huh. Um, so there's a lot of veterinarians that will say just to yank that tooth, pull it, get it out of there, be done and over with it. Now, there's the other possibility of trying something of a procedure called a vital pulpotomy. Basically, it's the equivalent of uh, cutting off part of the crown of the tooth and kind of sealing it up. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's shorter. It's still there. We're not really damaging that root structure. Those are, I'd say, probably two more common approaches. You can do braces, and you can try to restore that bite. Um, I don't know that a lot of veterinary dentists are really big fans of that, um, okay. but there are some that will pursue that. But um, just knowing that that's just a future problem waiting to happen, and, you know, I would probably say yanking that tooth is going to be the, the best and easiest solution that I could tell you to well, do. Uh, what I have, I have read about is that sometimes this tooth evidently is as long in the gum area as it is, hanging down and that it can interfere with her sinus cavities or something? Exactly, yeah. And actually, the way that any of those teeth on the upper jaw go is that there is, it's kind of like an iceberg. So what you see on the outside is, outside is only part of that tooth. Uh-huh. And that deeper part goes up and does penetrate part of the sinus. So, yeah, and when it's abnormally positioned, you're going to have more of a potential for problems there. Okay. Um, so so when, when we extract a tooth like that, we know we got to take out what we see and what we don't see on that tooth. Uh-huh. And if that tooth is removed fully and completely... And uh, that can be done, you know, with your veterinarian with the benefit of x-rays, where they take little digital x-rays of the teeth, just like when you go to the dentist and you put that bite film in your mouth. Okay. Uh, we we do that for dogs, but they're generally asleep and sitting still, and we do those same kind of um, x-rays, and that'll help to ensure that that tooth gets removed fully. So, in other words, fully. as far as leaving it go, is her teeth, would her teeth be fully formed now, or are they going to get longer? Because it's kind of like, it's funny because we call her... Her nickname is Elvis because she kind of looks like she's got that uh, curly lip, <laughs> you know, when <laughs> when she's uh, she's either got done eating or she's getting a treat or something, and then she'll look at you, and then she gets that tooth caught on her gum. And so I didn't know if that was if her tooth was fully formed yet, or if it's still going to grow more in, and then it's going to force those outer teeth out. Or I just, these are our third and fourth shelties. We've had two other shelties, and um, we've never had a problem with her teeth. And mm-hmm. they actually came from the same breeder. Uh, they are the um, great nephews of our eight-year-old Shelty that we had to put down in June that was part of our family. And so now we have uh, two tricolored ones, and we couldn't decide on just taking one, so we ended up having brother and sister now. Instead of just having one, we have two. <laughs> oh, wonderful. And the male, but, he's fine. His teeth are beautiful and perfect. It's just yeah, perfect. And you know, this this defect does come up. It's it's actually technically called uh, the term Lance Canine, uh-huh. um, and I think for for your baby's purposes, you're going to still see some growth in that tooth, and she's still young enough that you're going to see it kind of grow even further out. Okay. So um, you know, so it, I, it does, I would definitely it, more, it does warrant attention then. Yeah, I sure would, and um, you know. You may have had shelters your whole life, but, you know, these kind of things do crop up in the kind of any breed. You know, a little uh, problem can come up, a genetic defect that you never saw before if you've bred schnauzers your whole life. So, um, but, yeah, I think address it and you'll be you'll be on a good plane and she'll never know the difference without that tooth done in the long run. So this is Dr. Debbie. If you have a question for me, give me a call at Animal Radio, 1-866-405-8405. Hi, Patrick. How are you doing? Good, good. I'm stuck down here in Houston in traffic, but I'm doing oh, good. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, what kind of critter do you have, Patrick? Um, we've got a wolf at the house. He's a Arctic oh. wolf, timber wolf, I believe. And he's not a hybrid. He's actually a wolf, then. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He's he's full blooded wolf. Um, of course, we gotta list him as hybrid and everything like that. I guess get papers on him, but we have papers and everything on him. 
Um, I spoke to my wife last night. She said he's about 140 pounds, but he's big. He's real big, but he's real slender. And I know a few other people that have got well, that theirs are actually filled out. And I was okay. calling to see what I could do about that. How's his general overall health? Have you had any issues, any problems with diarrhea, vomiting, anything going on like that? No, no. And tell me a little bit about what you feed him, because I know for a lot of listeners, they're probably not really aware that people keep wolves as pets. Um, <laughs> He's the so best tell me a little bit about the world. <laughs> he is yeah. really, really good. Um, well, we feed him like dry dog food. And my wife will treat them to scraps, you know, meat scraps and stuff like that um, that have already been cooked and all that kind of stuff. And that's about what he eats on his, his diet. I've been hearing an ad about the uh, Dino Bite, I guess that's what it's called. Oh, yeah, everything. I heard that ad, too. <laughs> okay. who, who hasn't heard that ad? If you haven't heard <laughs> that ad, raise your hand. <laughs> so I was, uh, I was wondering, should we use that in order to increase the weight gain? I mean, would that help? Okay. You know, some um, kind of vitamin diet or something. Yeah. Now, I guess one other question I have is, um, is he neutered or is he intact? Yeah, he's intact. He's, uh, he's, he's not neutered or anything. Okay. Because um, in most of at least the wolf hybrids that I see, um, when you compare them to actually a regular dog, they do tend to be a much leaner um category of dog um, so they have a lot more muscle tone but they're more lanky so if he's lanky and but in good weight then i probably wouldn't be too worried about that um, okay. but if we're worried that he's really underweight there are a couple things and the one thing with diet with with wolves is you know kibble alone definitely doesn't do it for the wolves or the wolves hy- hybrids they do need to have a little bit more of a, actually like the meat base in it and and i'm not a fan of raw diets and my you know my ears burn when i talk about these kind of things but for the wolf uh and the wolf uh mixes um raw meat sometimes is very important because they have such a higher um, need for protein and so forth so okay. that might be something to, to maybe incorporate a bit more of that and um you know when you're in an area that i you know you probably don't have a veterinarian that takes care of them. Do they come out to the home, or do you ever have them taken care of? Well, we take them down to the vet, which is only about eight miles from the house. He loves to ride in the car. He goes crazy when he rides in the car. He just loves it. The reason I was asking about the veterinarian is one of the simplest things I would do is make sure that he does have a stool sample checked um, just okay. to have a screening for parasites because, um, you know, even everyday household dogs, um, you know, an undetected parasite can really rob them of a lot of not only nutrition um, but also kind of rob them of, you know, good healthy body weight. So that would be something I would definitely want to check out. And if he was a little bit more showing signs of being sickly, then I could list a whole bunch of different things that I'd look at. Um, but, you know, the other... The the reality is that with a lot of these guys, when they're not neutered, they are just in lean body mass. So um, unless you're planning on breeding this guy, um, you know, a lot of some of the behavioral problems for dogs translate over to, to wolves as well. Um, so neutering him certainly would potentially have the side effect of um, maybe increasing his body mass a little bit. If you have cats, I bet you didn't realize there's a connection between common health problems in cats to the type of litter you use. Ammonia forms in the litter box and can cause vomiting, diarrhea, drooling, panting, and even upper respiratory infections. You can stop this by switching to Cat's Incredible Litter. It has patented technology that stops ammonia from forming, with all profits going to help animals in need. Available now at your local pet store and Petco stores nationwide. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now at 1-866-405-8405. It's Animal Radio, celebrating the connection with our pets. Ladybug looks so cute this weekend. She's uh, testing out her costume for Monday. Well, she actually wear this costume, which it really isn't a costume, through Monday. Uh, yeah, she'll wear it actually for the next couple weeks. Okay. <laughs> for those of you that missed it, she's dressed up in, uh, well, she looks like a ladybug. You've painted her red, and I hope yes. you've used uh, safe coloring. I did. I used Kool-Aid. So the red, it will it will stay on her through a few washings. Yeah, I know that when I drink Kool-Aid, it stays on my tongue for there you go. weeks at a time. Yes. There's a red dye color. She's going to turn pink in the interim, won't she? It oh, that would be pretty. Yeah, it would be pretty. Yes. What are you working on over there in the newsroom for this hour? Well, you know, famous people get all of the good things, and so do some of the famous animals. Uh, but this one gets something, oh, let's see, it's really uh, kind of tourist trappy, 
And um, <laughs> yeah, do you know what I'm saying? I get it. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like the Hollywood Walk of Fame in this, but it's something different, but a great honor for this very famous animal. Okay, that's on the way in just a couple of minutes. Who else is on the way? Well, it looks like Strawberry the Chicken is on the way. Strawberry, of course, the chicken that watches television. Apparently, she had her leg amputated. She needed to have a little rest and rehab, and they mm-hmm. put a TV in front of her, and she goes crazy for this TV. <laughs> And uh, we'll be talking to her guardian and hopefully the chicken, too. And that's in just a couple of minutes right here on Animal Radio. But let's go to the calls with Dr. Debbie. Hey, Randy. Hello. How are you guys? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm hoping you guys can help me with uh, my cat problem. All right. Let's go for it. What do you got going on there? We have a white tabby type of cat. And we've had her for three and a half years now. And she's always been a great cat. We've never had problems with her. However, we got a puppy um, March of last year, a little mini pen, and brought her into the family. And ever since she came into the family, our one particular cat, whose name is Tink, likes to pee on everything. Pees in the cat box, but sneaks in the garage and pees in the gym bag or the kid's Ooh, toy. fun. And it's only been since we got the puppy. She peed on the puppy? No, <laughs> not yet. Oh. No, she, uh, oh, she wow, sneaks into the, the garage. She's, it's only in the garage and mine and my husband's gym bag. Or okay. if she can't get to the garage, because if we lock it, it's the garage coming from our house into the garage. Or if she can't get to the garage, it's only at nighttime when no one's looking. She'll go in the kids' playroom and she'll pee in their tent. You have a dog and do you have other cats as well? We do. We have two cats and we have three dogs and only the mini pen, the inside dog, who's inside all the time. And okay. it only started since we got the mini pen. Okay. How many litter boxes do you have there in that house? We have two litter boxes and they only seem to use the one, but we always keep two. Okay. As far as this kitty cat, anything else going on? Are we having any other kinds of aggression issues with the other kitties? Um, sometimes um, I can hear at night, sometimes him growling or her growling at our other cat. But for the most part, I mean, no other aggression. Okay. So the, the big causes for cats to urinate inappropriately are medical causes and behavioral causes. So my first crusade is always to make sure we're not missing anything medical. So I would, if you have not taken this kitty to a vet, have her checked out, get a urine sample, make sure all is well in her urinary world. Um, we can have crossover of behavioral with medical causes. So we really need to make sure we're not missing that aspect of things. But from there, there is a lot that we need to address for this kitty. And when we introduce a dog into a cat household or vice versa, you know, we always hope that they're going to get along. But that old phrase, they get along like cats and dogs, sometimes has some serious truth. And there are very big differences. It's kind of like, you know, some women can get along really well with other females and others, it's just like oil and water. So um, my fo- former college roommate, uh, okay, won't go there. Um, so let's just say that we need to work on making this kitty's environment more favorable for her. Now, dogs, things that cats don't like about dogs, they move fast, they make a lot of noise, and they disrupt a cat's peaceful world. So for cats that are having trouble in this situation, I recommend giving a lot of vertical escape to get away and to be superior to those dogs. Because cats, let's face it, they need to look down on dogs to say, he me a little dog. Dog. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh, he's infecting us all. Um, so, we want to give those vertical escapes. Those are cat trees, um, perches for windows, ways that we can find a peaceful zone. Um, the other things we need to do is work on this litter box situation because we usually want one more litter pan than we do the number of cats in a household. And that number can increase even if you have other things like two floor houses, um, if you have cats or dogs that go in or outside, we want to have them at different access points of the home. So a cat might avoid going to the normal litter pan if they have to go through a doorway or an area where, say, there's noisy children or a dog that might come chasing after them or annoy them. So we want to make sure that we have alternate litter box sites and make those so that they're in a quiet zone or they're away from the path of other animals and people. And preferably, I hate the lids. Take the lids off the gosh darn litter boxes. Cats do not dig those. Um, those are some of those basic things that we'll want to do. Now, for your dog, what we should do to kind of give your kitty cat a chance um, is to put a bell 
or some kind of uh, ringing uh, utensil on that doggy's collar. Give her a little heads up when that dog is coming around and give her the opportunity to seek out other avenues to get around the house or to get to the toilet if she needs to do that. Um, okay. And there are some other things we can do pheromones to kind of help relax the kitties and do a natural calming. Um, but for me, I think it's all about really thinking about what cats like and don't like about dogs in their life and to recognize that they have special needs. It doesn't matter that the other cats get along with that dog does not matter. It's a very much an individual thing. I hope these ideas work for you. And, uh, if, uh, if you need a follow up, we do follow ups. I believe we're the only radio show that does follow ups. And well, that's good, and I thought would totally help, and um, I will talk to my husband, we'll get more boxes, and put a little bell on our little penny, and let the cat know that she's coming. And get, and get those vertical spaces, they love those. You're listening to Animal Radio. Call the Dream Team now at 1-866-405-8405. Just because you don't have time to read a book doesn't mean you can't enjoy stories about artists and groups that you love. To discover a whole new world of audiobooks and hear the stories that made the music, visit HappylandAudio.com. That's HappylandAudio.com. Hey, everybody, this is Billy Dean, and you're listening to Animal Radio. This is an Animal Radio News Update brought to you by Fear Free. Fear Free takes the pet out of petrified and puts the treat into treatment. To learn more and find a certified Fear Free veterinary professional near you, visit fearfreepets.com. I'm Lori Brooks. You know, it doesn't matter how happy you are to get away from your hometown. Virtually every college student gets homesick, and that has been associated with a higher college attrition rate in the first year for college students there. Now, loneliness and isolation are among the top two contributors to dropping out of college. Mm. So as a result, universities pour tons and tons of money into trying to figure out how to ease the transition for their students. And a new study brings some great news on that front. According to researchers at the University of British Columbia, pet therapy, of course, can significantly reduce homesickness in students who are away from home. In that study, which was published, researchers gave 44 homesick UBC students a survey measuring their sense of belonging on campus, life satisfaction, and so on, and their homesickness, too. Now, these students were then divided into two groups, and one group received, how fun is this, eight weeks of dog therapy, and that started immediately. The other was told that their sessions with real dogs, as dog therapy would be, would begin after the first group had finished their round with it. Now, at the end of those eight weeks, both groups then took a satisfaction survey again. But not surprisingly, the students who got the dog therapy with the real live dogs reported more real life satisfaction and far less homesickness. And the group who didn't get to do the dog therapy at all actually had an increase in homesickness. Oh. The bottom line, pets can fix almost anything. We're everything, even if you have to give them back at the end of the day. Yeah, Dr. Debbie, you were pretty homesick at college, weren't you? You're always talking I, about that. Yeah, I was actually pet sick because I had a childhood dog that I had to leave when I went away to college. And in pre-vet, I actually, I snuck a lizard into my dorm. And <laughs> that, I had to have a pet. I was whole, I was just miserable. You know, you can't have an animal lover like a vet student and, you know, not allow them to have a pet. So uh, that was my, uh, <laughs> my you, sneaky pet. Did you, you never got caught? on that huh well i did actually yes <laughs> my my resident advisor came into my dorm room and um, i hid this in usually in my closet when i was expecting someone to come around <laughs> but it was out of my desk and she looked and this was a fence lizard and they hide under the gravel usually um so she came in and didn't see anything but crickets jumping around in the cage and she said you can't have pets and i said well i know i'm i'm just kind of lonely so she thought i had the crickets as pets oh she never yes. saw the lizard so she said you got to get rid of the crickets she must have thought i was a kook you see most most girls were sneaking guys into their dorm rooms but you were sneaking lizards in and crickets and crickets <laughs> I love it. Well, Grumpy the Cat, the Internet's most famous scowling feline, not only unveiled a waxwork of herself recently at Madame Tussauds Wax Museum in Washington, D.C. She Really, is she the cutest thing or what? But she also joined the cast of the Broadway musical Cats to help them close out the show. 
on Broadway in New York, big time. She was cheered on by the cast on stage and the audience as well as she received a placard commemorating her Broadway debut, but still did not crack a smile. I wanted to mention that she, I don't know why she's so grumpy. First of all, I didn't even know it was a she until, so, until you just mentioned it, but I do know that she has tens of millions of dollars from the franchise for Grumpy Cat, and I can't figure out how to, how would, I couldn't be grumpy anymore. Yeah. Sorry. I, I think that scowling came, it has something to do with her dwarfism. Oh, really? And I, yeah, yeah I'm not sure how, it, how it's related, but that's what I've read. What is it, Dr. Debbie? Well, just the the way that her facial bones have grown, uh-huh. um, yeah, that it's part of her condition. Yeah. So she's actually stuck looking grumpy yeah, is what you're saying. she can't smile. She can't smile. Okay, now I understand. Instagram users have been watching an energetic golden retriever named Harlow grow into a service dog over the past year and a half, and each day... Harlow is so smart, she becomes more skilled, and her Instagram page grows as well in popularity with more than 70,000 followers right now. Harlow's owner is 20-year-old Jackie Blake, and they live in Florida. Jackie, though, has an autonomic nervous system disorder that frequently causes her to faint, and she gets very dizzy and then passes out. So Harlow is now in training to be her medical alert and mobility service dog. She notifies Jackie when she senses something bad might happen, such as if Jackie is about to pass out. Jackie, the owner, says without Harlow, she would be very limited in what she can do, that even leaving the house by herself would be out of the question, let alone continuing to pursue a college education for her dream career of becoming an occupational therapist. Harlow is a huge human helper in all of this. She knows how to get her own leash, retrieve house keys, and pick up virtually anything that Jackie drops. Uh, Harlow can put away laundry. She closes the dishwasher, turns on and off lights at the switch, and picks up groceries from the bottom shelf at the store because Jackie can't bend over to pick them up. Now, when Jackie says, water bottle, I'm thirsty, Harlow picks up her cue, goes to the kitchen, opens the refrigerator, grabs a bottle of water from it, delivers the water bottle to Jackie, usually in the living room in her chair, and then returns to shut the refrigerator door. Uh, Can we train Ladybug to do that? That would be good. I, but she can't reach. Oh, she can't reach well, the refrigerator. To, yeah, and even if you Give put a step <laughs> stool. Yeah, but you have a step stool, then you can't open it because the stool's in the way. So she'd have a difficult time. Sorry, okay, Hal. Okay. Oh well, I guess. But I think you would be training her what, maybe for beer, Hal. Yeah, probably. Well, I wasn't going to say that. Yeah. I'd say get her a mini. <laughs> we could do a mini fridge. Like get a little mini bar type of thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm Lori Brooks. Get more breaking animal news anytime at animalradio.com. This has been an Animal Radio News Update brought to you by Fear Free. The veterinarian isn't typically thought of as your pet's favorite place to go. With Fear Free, that all changes. To learn more and find a certified Fear Free veterinary professional near you, visit fearfreepets.com. Hi, friends. This is Dr. Marty Becker, America's veterinarian. As you know, going to the vet can be a traumatic experience for your pet, but it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, vet visits can be something your pet looks forward to. Introducing Fear Free. When your veterinarian is Fear Free certified, you will be assured your pet's vet visit is more free of fear, anxiety, and stress than ever before. Fear Free takes the pet out of petrified, and it puts the treat into treatment. To find a certified Fear Free veterinarian near you, go to fearfreepets.com. Hello, everyone. It's Robert Simro, your Pet World Insider, here with this week's Animal Radio List, seven Halloween treats to keep your pets safe. So Halloween comes around every year, and every year you hear the warning about pet safety on this night. Don't people learn, you think? Well, I and other pet experts will tell you yes and no. So for those of you who need a gentle reminder and others who need a firm talking to, here's my list of things to consider for Halloween pet safety. To begin with, while Halloween is about dressing up and candy for humans, it's the exact opposite for our pets. It's an uncomfortable horror show when the humans they observe and love turn into costumed goofballs who certainly need a week or 12 of human behavior classes. Also, if you're going to dress up your pets, here's a few tips and ideas. Never force a pet to wear a costume or an outfit. For many pets, it's the equivalent of a human being being forced to wear a wetsuit. It's uncomfortable, makes them overheat, and the embarrassment in this age of the Internet may never fade. However, if your pet will tolerate an outfit, give them time to adjust to it. 
put it on for short periods of time and let them adjust to wearing it and reinforce that it's not a permanent thing. Additionally, consider alternatives to full outfits. There are pet paints, pet nail polish, and pet bling that are much less irritating and just as fun. The key to all of this is pet safety and making sure that anything you're putting on or near your pet is safe for them. Next up is the trick-or-treaters. If your neighbors only dressed up as postal workers and delivery drivers, that would be upsetting enough for most pets. Add to that ghouls, goblins, witches, devils, superheroes, and much more, and you can see the confusion that your pets have. Your dog in particular instinctually wants to protect its family. Consider giving your protector the night off by putting them in a bedroom with the TV on or music playing. Also, the doorbell is like a starter's pistol to your pups. Well, after the 15th doorbell or so, your dog figures everyone is out to get you. Don't allow your pet access to the doorway area. Consider having a please knock sign or even greeting the trick-or-treaters outside. Next up is candy and foods associated with Halloween. Please keep your pets away from all candy as it can be severely dangerous for your pets. The same goes for lit pumpkins. If they get too close, they can knock it over or even burn themselves. And a glow stick looks like a tempting new toy, which if bitten or ingested can have extremely serious consequences. Finally, please make sure your pet's IDs are up to date and can be read easily. Halloween's a lot of fun for the family, just not our pets. Keeping them and your visitors safe is not a trick or treat, it's a responsibility. Share your Halloween tips on our Animal Radio Facebook page. Dogs or cats, horse or emu, animals are people too. Ever wonder why you see black cats at Halloween? Well, it seems that people have had strange thoughts about black cats for a long time. In Scotland, a black cat at your door means upcoming prosperity, while in Ireland, if a black cat crosses your path at midnight, you'll get sick and die. Some people believe that if you stroke a black cat's tail three times, your bad luck will turn to good luck, and others believe if you pet a black cat's tail, it'll cure a sty in your eye. A long time ago, some people believed that black cats had special powers and were witches in disguise. That's why you see witches and black cats at Halloween. Most people today just think black cats are like any other kind of cat, and that's why we love them. I'm Britt Savage for Animal Radio. Animals are people too. Animal Radio. Hi, this is Creston. Of course, you know me as the amazing Creston. And you're listening to me on Animal Radio. Don't forget to spade and neuter those loved ones which we bonded with our pets. Just because you don't have time to read a book doesn't mean you can't enjoy stories about artists and groups that you love. To discover a whole new world of audiobooks and hear the stories that made the music, visit HappylandAudio.com. That's HappylandAudio.com. You're listening to Animal Radio. If you missed any part of today's show, visit us at AnimalRadio.com or download the Animal Radio app for iPhone and Android. It's Animal Radio, celebrating the connection with our pets. That could be your cats, your dogs, your flamingos, even your chickens. Your chickens? Absolutely. <laughs> our next-door neighbors, they have chickens. I, I love to watch them for them when they go away. It's a lot of fun. They have so much personality. They do. They're they all do. Different. We see a lot of chickens at my office, and that's the overwhelming theme, is people love them for their personality. Well, you know who we have on the phone right now is Olivia Fox. She hangs out with Strawberry the Chicken, and if you remember Strawberry the Chicken, the video that went viral, apparently Strawberry likes to watch TV. Welcome to the show, Olivia. Thank you. Now, tell us a little bit about Strawberry. Uh, how did she come into your life? Well, Strawberry was one of the rescues we adopted from Animal Place. She, she is the chicken with the most personality we have ever, ever had. And we love all our girls, but this one has a mind of her own and is not afraid to express it. Now, is she ill? No, so what happened is that she had to have part of her foot amputated, oh, wow. and in order to be able to recover, she had to be kept off her feet, and oh. that's how she ended up in that suspension, yeah. Um, honestly, the biggest problem that we're facing right now is I never, ever, ever should have introduced her to Pop-Tarts. To Pop-Tarts? So she loves TV uh-huh. and Pop-Tarts. <laughs> wow. And Pop-Tarts. I'm having the hardest time convincing her to you know, go back to normal chicken food. So I have a hand extended in front of her. I wish you could see this right now. The chicken food in my left hand. She is looking at me, looking at my hand, 
and look at me like, are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, that's the sound she makes when she is not happy with me. Well, no, since she had to be, just so listeners know, since she had to be off her feet, I guess he wanted to entertain her, so she was watching TV? Yeah, what happens is that she's, she's a smart girl, and like many of our chickens, chickens will get bored if, if they don't have anything to do. You're talking about a species that um, can do math, that can do uh, simple math problems, that has 24 different calls to communicate, that can recognize over 100 faces. These are smart animals. They like problem solving. And so when we had her in the sling, when she didn't have anything to do, she tried to escape, but she'd get bored. And um, my, my husband finally just said, well, why don't we give her something to watch? And, um, and we turned on the iPad, and that was it. By the way, she's gone quiet right now because I've attended her with a cherry pie. Cherry so I'm pie. Not to step a fork down. <laughs> Boy, I don't know about her diet, Olivia. Yeah. It sounds. Uh... I know. Doctor Debbie wouldn't approve. I I, I'm thinking I'm fatty sure. liver disease. All I'm thinking. <laughs> so I'm she... Sure. well, she she really she doesn't have that much. Uh, we are trying to get her to gain weight, actually, and, and we've done we've done well so far. But we're always looking to uh, to plump her up. Yes, sweetie. So there's so she likes it good to communicate with us. So there's thousands of TV shows. How did you decide on one that she would actually like? We just tried a few of them. Um, what we what we learned is that yes, she loves National Geographic. Um, what we learned the hard way is that um, we, we should have thought of this before. But having predator reptiles on National Geographic was not the best thing for her to watch. Or reptiles. So we, Predators. Yeah, we've learned to, to steer clear of alligator shows. Oh, yes, definitely. Well, I'm thinking with her diet, she soon should be watching NCIS Miami or something like that. Exactly. <laughs> What's in her future? I mean, is she she obviously uh, has one leg amputated. She Does she get up and get around? So she is. She, she's, she's, it's really been a, a wonderfully inspiring progress. Uh, she is right now standing up. Um, she's learning more balance, and she's walking towards the phone and, of course, the rest of the cherry pie. <laughs> so you may hear her. She gets closer. I think she's, yep, that's strong. She's telling you to put up the on the pie. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So are the other chicken picking and, up her bad habits? No, no, they're not allowed in the house. We only have uh, one little girl in the house called Tina. Um, who's in the house right now because she's um, she's she's the one to the litter. She was very small, um, and we're just praying that she doesn't pick up strawberries as food habits because then it's like having two teenagers in the house. She has her own Facebook page, huh? Yes, she does. She's got more likes than either than actually than my husband and I combined. I'm ten. Yeah, she's a star of the family. What does she post? You know, she has such a lively personality that we have. Um, well, she's happy. Strawberry purrs, and it's the most wonderful sound I've ever heard. Um, and so we've got videos of her purring and falling asleep, and those are hugely popular. I'm sorry. Strawberry is now complaining because, check this out, she had gotten to the end of the filling, and so now there's only the dough left. Oh, Strawberry I hate that. Strawberry is not happy. <laughs> I, I, I commiserate with her. I, under, I empathize. I know exactly what it's like to just get to the dough, and that's all that's left. <laughs> there you go. So the filling is gone, and she's looking at me, and nope, no, she, she won't even take the filling. Yep, there we go. What kind Sorry, of chicken is strawberry? She's a Rhode Island red. A Rhode Island red. See, I didn't even realize there was more than one type of, of chicken. Oh, a... honey. Yeah. Oh, my. Yeah. Really? There are hundreds and hundreds of types. There's a documentary that came out recently called, um, I think it was Poultry People. And it is the world of competitive poultry showing, which we don't take a, a part in, but Think dog shows. There's that many. You'll get chickens that look like the weirdest creatures on earth. Seriously. Well, it's so much fun. They're the most hilarious things to watch. They, they really, it's like a soap opera every day. They're so serious about it, and there's feuds, and there's allegiances, and I, I, I could swear there's hurt feelings. I mean, yeah. They'll make you laugh every single day. Well, I'm going to go check out the Facebook page right now for Strawberry, and I'll put all the links for listeners over at AnimalRadio.com if you want to check out the videos. Uh, just head on over there. We've we've compiled all of the links for the Facebook page, the YouTube videos, and some more information about Strawberry at the website there. Olivia, thank you so much for hanging with us today, and please thank give you. Strawberry a big old hug from us. And more cherry filling. We will. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Okay, before we let you go, we want to remind you to have a very, very fun but safe Halloween, make sure to keep your animals away 
from the chocolates and all of the candies and don't be somebody that ends up in Dr. Debbie's office on Tuesday morning. Safe trick or treating. <laughs> And happy Halloween. This is Animal Radio Network. Network.